Great, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today to talk about dependency management in C and C++. My name is Aaron. I'll be your host for today's discussion, and I'm joined by Jessica Black, a senior software engineer here at, at FOSSA. Welcome, Jess. And a big thanks to the Linux Foundation for hosting us today. Um, as was mentioned, we'll be happy to take questions throughout the presentation. So feel free to drop questions into the Q&A um, at any point. Uh, we'll try and take as many of them as we can in real time, and we'll get to the ones that we can't in the Q&A at the end. So let's take a look at our agenda. We're gonna start with a quick overview of the C, C++ ecosystem. Then we'll take a look at some of the various methods that exist for including dependencies in your C, C++ project, including vendoring, static linking, and dynamic linking. Then we'll dig a little deeper to see how FOSSA identifies those dependencies across all three scenarios. And we'll wrap things up with the Q&A. Now, before I hand things off um, to Jess, a quick word for folks who are not familiar with FOSSA. We provide technology that makes it easier and more efficient for organizations to manage the open source software they use. So this includes identifying and remediating open source vulnerabilities, as well as identifying and complying with licenses in your open source code. So basically, if you're using open source like Slack, Uber, and Confluent, you should be using FASA to manage it. Great. Now let's talk dependencies. Um, starting, per, starting first with a quick intro of our distinguished speaker. Um, Jess is a senior software engineer. She works on features like our C, C++ dependency scanner. And she specializes in relational databases, server software, and CLIs, primarily using languages like Go, Haskell, and Rust. So we're super happy to have Jessica here with us today. Thanks again for joining us, Jess. Um, I'll let you take it from here. All right. Um... Hi, everyone. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, so uh, CNC++, as I'm sure most people here are aware, um, is frequently used uh, in what we call systems programming. Um, so performance critical or lower level areas like games is a common example, or um, you know, hardware drivers, databases, networking stacks. Uh, according to the Stack Overflow survey in 2021, um, over 20% of the of developers did some form of C, C or C++ development uh, last year. Um, you know, it's been a popular language forever, and that's uh, not changing. Um, next slide, please. So uh, whenever we use open source, um, it is, uh, you know, it's, it's always great to be able to um, get us off the ground quickly and uh, filling gaps that we don't have to develop ourselves, essentially. Um, but the biggest issue with using open source alongside that convenience and, and velocity is um, that it can some, sometimes be risky, both from a license compliance standpoint and a security standpoint. Um, you know, there's uh, all kinds of concern about using like GPL licensed um, software or, um, you know, uh, security issues like Heartbleed or um, other other major security problems like that, or minor ones um, like you know buffer overflows. Uh, so uh, tracking those risk vectors um, is really important, um, and uh, and yeah, that's what we're looking to do with this. Uh, next slide, please. So a big key with C and C plus plus is compared to other languages. Um, C and C++ projects usually don't have uh, any kind of package manifest listing their packages that they depend on. So on the right-hand side, there's an example manifest from a Rust project, um, and you can see all of the different dependencies and their versions. Uh, and so with other languages, um, you know, you can look through this list and get a good starting point. This isn't the whole story, but get a good starting point for um, what dependencies you're using uh, with C and C++, as again, I'm sure most people here are aware, um, we largely don't have that. Obviously, there are some open source package, package managers, managers uh, like uh, Conan like is a big one. Um, but by and large, uh, most C and C++ projects um, don't use that and instead use a mix of like local vendor dependencies or, uh, or system dependencies pulled in. Um, and so finding these is hard and uh, organizations often will rely on software composition analysis tools to inventory their dependencies um, and then, you know, list that compliance and security uh, issues that they have. Um, next slide, please. 
Jess, actually, before we go to the next slide, um, you talked about dependencies, but each of those dependencies have dependencies and have their dependencies, right? So it's, it's turtles all the way down. So the, the problem you're talking about really covers not just the complete set of direct, but also the indirect dependencies that a project might have, right? Yep, exactly, yeah. Um, I kind of touched on that with uh, basically this isn't the whole story, um, but yeah, to like kind of iterate further, um, essentially, uh, every one of these dependencies can have their own dependencies, and um, sometimes those can be like hidden even to where, you know, um, uh, like in this example, using a cargo project, uh, they might have, they might actually statically link new dependencies in, in a way that's not even in this manifest. So yeah, they're, uh, the whole story is pretty complicated and, uh, and, and multi-layered. Great. Um, so yeah, so uh, before we discuss identifying dependencies, um, we'll kind of go through some common methods of including them in C and C++ applications. Um, this is not necessarily the entire list of ways you can include dependencies, uh, but definitely these are kind of what we have seen as the most common ways of including it or including dependencies. So a very popular way uh, for dependency inclusion is to vendor them. And that essentially looks like placing some subset, maybe it's the whole thing, maybe it's just part of a dependency into some kind of subdirectory of your project, for example, inside of a vendor directory. Um, this screenshot shows uh, the Facebook Folly project uh, put into a vendor project or vendor directory inside of the project directory. And the benefit to this is it's relatively straightforward to get started. Um, you just copy and paste the code and uh, you just integrate it with your build system, which can be messy at times, but um, you know, then you have full control over how you compile it and exactly what parts of the dependency are compiled um, and they just kind of slot in. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another common way to include dependencies is static linking. Um, so, you know, vendoring is potentially easy and gives you a lot of control. Um, but sometimes it's preferred to compile the dependencies into binaries statically um, and then distribute those and uh, just include them that way. Um, this is really common for like internal teams developing a library and then distributing it internally or for like vendors um, who develop some like library that you have to um, either pay for or, uh, you know, they just offer the pre-compiled binaries either way. Um, but these are common ways to uh, to include those dependencies. Um, and sometimes these can be centralized into the package manager as well. So like um, using a, a Linux package manager, sometimes it pulls in static linking uh, or statically linked libraries as well. Um, next slide, please. And then the last uh, common way that we've seen dependencies included is dynamically linking. Um, and this is very similar to static in that you link against a pre-compiled binary. The main difference is that um, with static linking, that linking is performed, that compiling together is performed at build time, um, whereas dynamic linking, it's, it's done at runtime. Um, so whenever you distribute the, the application to the end computer, um, that library has to be present on the on the computer. Um, but this is a very, very common way to link in, especially like standard libraries um, or very commonly used libraries um, across the ecosystem, uh, just because, you know, often you can assume that they're there or um, make sure that they're there by installing them first with some installation script. Uh, and then that makes your deployment a little bit a little bit easier. And not to mention you can patch your dependencies as well, and then patch all your applications at the same time. Uh, next slide, please. So the pros and cons of these kind of dependency inclusion methods are, um, it, it really varies by project and even by dependency. A lot of the time, C and C++ projects will use all three of these in some mixture um, because some of them are better for some dependencies and some are better for others. So, um, you know, vendoring, you can build it from source at the same time, um, provides maximal flexibility. Um, a big con is that it's kind of difficult for SCA tools to track. Uh, essentially, since we have no package manifest, 
uh, and these are just files that are part of your depend or part of your project tree. There's no obvious way to kind of uh, rope them off as like a dependency. Um, you know, using that like vendor folder that I mentioned earlier can sometimes be a clue, but there's no like standardized way to refer to that. And so, um, yeah, it's very, very much a mixed bag as far as like analysis goes. Uh, static linking is a great middle ground between vendoring and dynamic linking. Um, kind of its biggest con, I would say, is that um, it's hard for compilers to fully inline binaries. Um, and so uh, often the binary that's actually um, produced is going to be larger or uh, less efficient than like being able to compile the source yourself where the compiler can reason about the code more correct or more fully. Um, it also is really, really hard for SCA tools to track. Uh, without some kind of package manager or like a linker integration. Uh, and that's largely because like once you compile in that statically linked binary, um, there's it, it largely disappears. Uh, and there's no there's not even the like source code to uh, statistically analyze like we can do with vendoring. Um, often these are totally invisible uh, without, like I said, without some kind of like, ability to integrate with like what the linker is actually doing. Um, and then the last uh, that we covered is dynamic linking. Um, it's really easy to include these in a project. Um, its biggest con is that it's difficult to create a reproducible build in runtime environment. Um, I kind of mentioned that whenever you deploy a binary that is built with dynamic linking, you have to ensure that that uh, dynamically linked library is on the target system. Um, and sometimes, uh, sometimes it's there, but it's not exactly the same one that you built against. So things will be a little bit different. Um, so that can that can just be tricky. It's certainly manageable, um, but can just be tricky sometimes. Uh, it's also really easy for SCA tools to track because we can just ask the system what dynamic dependencies is this binary using, uh, and then look those up against the system package manager or you know, um, like I mentioned, Conan, like if kind of where to pull in something like this, uh, then we could theoretically ask it. Um, so yeah, so it's it's pretty straightforward. Uh, next slide. Yeah, this is this is great, Jess. I just one quick thing to make it maybe a little bit more concrete. So you know, we we talk in the in the title of this about this kind of blind spot that's there with regards to the dependency management, and I can see how with these different inclusion methods, it's easy for things to kind of get lost. But I wonder if you know, you mentioned the Heartbleed um, example in OpenS. SSL a little bit earlier. I wonder, is that the kind of thing that could get lost in this blind spot if you're not kind of able to see all these dependencies at the depth that you need to? Yeah, good question. Yeah, I definitely think so. The um, stuff like Heartbleed, uh, I know that this isn't C and C++, but stuff like, um, uh, the name is escaping me, the uh, uh, the log you want, log for J. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, stuff like that is definitely things that we can um, that we can easily lose track of with like the dependency graphs of modern projects. Um, C and C plus plus often try to use fewer dependencies than other ecosystems, like say uh, JavaScript with npm. Um, but uh, but still, like the dependency graph is usually um, relatively large and relatively hard to track, especially for uh, you know, the developers that are trying to trying to fix and ship things. Um, so yeah. We had one more quick question that came in on the Q&A as well. So um, are you familiar with Nix? And if so, where do you think that fits in here? Yeah, uh, great question. Yeah, Nix, I think, fits in really well. Kind of, um, I think that Nix is very well positioned to solve a lot of these problems. Um, I will caveat this with saying I haven't personally uh, dove too deeply into Nix. I've done a lot of reading about it, but not actually used it. Actually, Jess, um, before you go a little too deep, like for maybe folks that don't know what Nix is, maybe start with what is Nix and then kind of how do you think it fits in? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, good idea. Um, so Nix essentially uh, kind of at a high level is a, um, a deterministic uh, package manager, essentially. Um, or at least that's how I think I would describe it. Uh, so um, the idea is like with a standard package manager system, 
uh, like say apt, you might say apt get this package and um, the uh, its dependencies, you know, kind of depend on what the package manager wants to pull in at that time, like whatever it thinks is most appropriate. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, the version that you get will depend, you know, if you ask for a specific version, that's fine. But like, if you ask for like the latest, then it'll depend on the latest. Um, and so that whole like graph of, of dependencies of a thing that you pull in through the package manager is like very dependent on the time at which you pull it in uh, or can be. Uh, Nix is very much more deterministic where um, usually all of that will, will be more, uh, more static and more reproducible. So, um, you know, when you pull in one, you're, you know what you're getting. Uh, and I think that um, Nix works really well for like dynamic linking. I think it's, I remember reading that it can be like kind of hard sometimes to get it to set up well with like certain compilers um, just because it puts stuff in like some non-standard locations. But assuming you work around all that, I think like dynamic linking is like largely solved. Like the frustrations of the reproducible build is largely solved with Nix. Mm -hmm. um, I think like static linking is is largely the same. Uh, I think vendoring doesn't really apply because that's not really pulled in with the package manager. So that's like still you're kind of on your own. But Nix can definitely help with the with the latter two here. Great. Let's keep moving. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about C and C plus plus dependencies. Um, how we include them. So we'll now we'll talk about how FASA identifies them. Uh, next slide. So our design principles with our C and C++ support for FASA are maintainability is better than correctness, is better than speed. Uh, and I'm sure this will be uh, kind of familiar if you've looked at any of FASA's other um, blog posts or anything before this, because this is a very common kind of talking point for us. Um, but essentially, we think that maintainability leads to long-term correctness, uh, and you know our customers care more about correctness than speed. So that's kind of where we focus. Um, and so what you're seeing today is kind of like the result of those principles, where we're focusing on maintainability first, and then correctness. And kind of, uh, you know, this is um, this product is still like early stages. So um, so yeah, we'll we'll be going along those those principles as we go. Uh, next slide. So our first strategy for, uh, I'll talk about these in the same order that we talked about before. Essentially, uh, for vendor code, our, our strategy for this is VSI, vendored sourcing identification. And uh, VSI compares the fingerprints of files in your project with the ones that we've seen on the internet. So we have a separate process, essentially, that um, crawls open source uh, repositories that we know about and uh, records fingerprints for all of the uh, all of the files that we find and records metadata about those dependencies um, and then uh, and we kind of store that in like a large database in the cloud and then when uh, you actually scan your project our tool uh, performs fingerprinting on your files the same way and then uploads those fingerprints and uh, the fingerprint file paths to our back our backend, uh, which then essentially compares um, compares your source code uh, like the fingerprints of your source code against the open source projects that we've seen. Um, and our algorithm is actually kind of, uh, I believe, kind of unique. Obviously, you know, who really knows what everybody's algorithms are, but it seems like ours provides results that is a little more that are a little more um, a little more accurate because we, we what we kind of try to do is uh, apply kind of what we think of as like a file subtree mask on your on your project. And so essentially, whenever we look at your project, rather than looking file by file for matches, instead we're looking kind of subtree by subtree. So like we look at all of the files in a directory and all of the files in like a given subtree and compare that against an open source subtree that we've seen before. And if it closely matches enough, then we'll say, ah, yes, we believe this to be this dependency. Um, so we think it's pretty, pretty um, able to resist like a lot of the noise issues that a lot of uh, 
a similar solutions have. Uh, next slide. Sorry, quick question on this, Jess. Um, is VSI uh, the same technology as it, usually think. used for OSS snippet scanners? Oh, sorry. Uh, I didn't catch all of that. Can you oh, repeat? sorry. Is VSI the same technology that's usually used for OSS snippet scanners? Uh, it's very similar. So uh, snippet scanners will typically categorize um, the contents of a file into you know, different snippets, um, and then they'll compare those. Uh, and then usually they'll um, often, well, often what they'll do is kind of uh, try to group those up and like, you know, eliminate super noisy snippet matching. Um, but often they'll be pretty noisy because they're looking at like all of the different pieces of a file, which a lot of files have a lot in common, um, even in, in disparate projects. Uh, kind of what we do instead of snippet scanning uh, is rather than go with that like, sub file pieces to look up. We kind of look at like more than the file level. Like we like kind of the files are like our base unit. Mm -hmm. And then we try to look more at like the directory level or the subtree level rather than uh, smaller pieces of a single file, essentially. Great. Um, yeah, so the the next one is static linking. Um, so uh, FOSSA identifies statically linked dependencies, um, mostly with user provided data. So essentially, users uh, tell FOSSA about um, a compiled binary that they're distributing. So like in this screenshot, we have this libjson internal .o. So in this scenario, um, the tool or the team that makes libjson internal.o would tell FOSSA about this binary and say, uh, I've built, I've compiled this binary and it is this internal project named libjson internal. It has this license, whatever. Um, or, you know, if it's like a open source project um, and they're just like pulling the open source project and distributing it, uh, building it and distributing it, then like they could fill in the open source project information. Um, but either way, they tell FOSSA about this binary. And then later, when users are um, scanning their projects, uh, our system, like the, the VSI system that I talked about earlier, essentially is able to look for these um, user-provided matches first and kind of eliminate them from the match tree. So, so the first thing that it does is basically say, well, uh, this binary was, or this file was one that was uh, told to the algorithm as being this dependency. And so it'll uh, basically say, okay, that's a match, and then rope that off from the rest of the algorithm. Um, and so essentially, uh, you, you have to provide the data to FOSSA, but once that's done, um, it can detect it in any other project in the organization. Um, next slide. Quick. Quick question on on dependent on static linking we got um, in the Q and A. So, um, if you're using an artifactory like JFrog or SPAC to manage dependencies in static linking, then is that also then can you also use that to generate SBOMs and perform SCA and other things? Or kind of how do those tools help? Yeah. Um, so the uh, the way to integrate that right now um, would be to essentially pull, uh, and this could be like an automated process, um, but essentially to pull the artifacts from like that artifactory instance, and then, uh, you know, register those into FOSSA saying like, this is that artifact and it has this information. Um, and then yes, uh, once that's done, um, we would be able to then report that as a dependency and uh, include it in our, you know, in, in like SBOMs or other reports. Great. Um, and then the last uh, method that we've talked about is dynamic linking. Um, and I kind of touched on this earlier when I was saying that like for SCA tools, dynamic linking is pretty simple. Um, and we essentially take advantage of that for our dynamic linking support. Um, we just read the dynamic section of the binary. Um, when on, on platforms that we can do this, we just rely on LDD. Uh, to just tell us the uh, the contents of the binary. 
And then uh, we use the system package manager to associate those linked binaries with packages. So like if we run LDD on a program and it says you're using libc uh, .so six, um, And then we just, we just ask the local package manager like, okay, what package owns this binary? And then, um, and then we report that along with all of its uh, metadata, such as licenses. Um, if dependencies are linked but not owned, like for example, if it was distributed externally from the package manager, um, the current solution is to flag that as an unlicensed dependency. So you see it and you see the path to it, um, but it just doesn't have any license information originally or like immediately attached. And uh, next time, whenever we're ready. That's great. And and thanks everybody for tossing your Q&A into the, the uh, Q&A box. Keep the questions coming. They've been great so far. I got another one here for you, uh, Jess. So among these dependency management methods, how do you feel each fits with an environment where you're using code security scanning tools like SonarCube? So vendor code seems to be the obvious answer, but they're looking for more of a nuanced answer. And I think you've talked a little, little bit about it because all three of them are, are used. Uh, we use all three of them when we when it comes to code security scanning. But I'm, I'm curious, like, to in, from your perspective, how do you think each of them fits? Yeah, um, I think when it comes to tools like SonarCube, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I don't think that they can scan things that are not code. So I think that like vendoring code is kind of the only thing that they can support off the top of my head. I'm not certain that this is the case, uh, but I, that's my understanding. Um, certainly, I think that uh, I think that it kind of I think that like ideally for these for tools like this or or other static analysis tools like Cerner Cube, um, the ideal would probably be vendored. Um, and then like for static or dynamic, I think probably the best bet would be to uh, have that as like a, like a, like as a project that you scan with those tools. And then, um, you know, you can track that dependency through FASA and then like, or, or some other SCA and then like um, uh, scan the, the local or scan that project using like the sonar cube. And then you, you have more, um, more insight into like what they're doing. Um, yeah, I, I think I think that would be best. Uh, apologies if I'm not remembering Sonar Cube's capabilities correctly. <laughs> That's okay. We're putting you on the spot here, Jess. We're throwing you all the hard, <laughs> all the curveballs. Uh, but we can jump to the next slide now. Um, yeah. So uh, I think the key takeaways for this are uh, essentially just because C and C++ dependencies are so unmanaged, typically, um, you know, SCA tools like FASA, we've traditionally struggled to accurately identify the dependencies in these languages, um, just because they're so varied and the use, the use cases are so um, specific, like everyone is used in different scenarios. And so we have to develop uh, solutions for each different situation. Um, and this has left organizations more vulnerable to open source compliance and security risk. Um, you know, you can't mitigate what you don't know is there. Um, and so uh, we think that with what we're bringing to the table now, um, it's, it's going to improve this support a lot for um, everybody who's using C and, plus, C, and C++ uh, to be able to view their dependency graph in a more, um, more fully featured way. Great, I got another question here for you. Um, so, and I think this goes back to some of the things you mentioned in, during, when you were talking about the vendor code, but for some of the C and C++ dependencies um, that do not have kind of the pre-build package, um, this team is downloading the source code from GitHub and then building it in their CI CD process and then statically linking it. So in that case, how can we generate, how would they generate an SBOM because the hash value fingerprint of the dependency will not match the open source database or may not match the open source database? Um, yeah, so I think my, I think what I'm hearing is, uh, because it's being downloaded and then built and then statically linked, I guess, in a separate step, um, the concern is that we wouldn't see that statically linked dependency, uh, because it, the source is no longer there. Um, I think the, the best way to make that work with our current support would be to, 
uh, during that process where you're building it into a static binary. Um, essentially, uh, we support the ability to scan that original source code and like store that in FASA and then link that built binary um, with that static linking process that I talked about before. And then that way um, you have all of the information that we found for that, um, for that dependency during the initial scan. And then it gets statically linked in and, uh, and then identified with a, uh, a VSI scan uh, further down the pipeline. I think that that's, um, I don't know if that like well explains it. It's a little complicated of a process, uh, but definitely I think that there's a, uh, basically the, our, our static linking support is designed to handle a, a pipelining system like that. That makes sense. And you keep, basically you keep the source code so that you can do that original scan and then link it to the binary once you produce the binary. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, essentially like, it's like, during the build process, there'll be something where like you'll run like, you know, GCC dash O, whatever, whatever. Um, and uh, and essentially like right after that command, before like the source code is cleaned up or before it moves on to the next stage in the CI pipeline, uh, we would just run FASA and uh, and record that linking essentially. That's great. Thanks again for the question. Do we have any other questions? I'll give it maybe. 15 seconds or 30 seconds here for folks to jump into the Q&A and ask any final questions. Otherwise, um, we're going to wrap things up here. I don't see anything just yet. So I'll jump to the thank you screen. Um, I want to thank uh, the Linux Foundation for hosting us today. And thank you, Jess, for sharing all of your experience with us. Um, if anybody um, has any further questions, ah, and I knew it, one jumped in right when I was ready to, to wrap things up. Um, Yes. How, how do we define um, package URLs for C, C++ open source libraries? Because there's no ecosystem for C, C++. And so it's very difficult to identify the source of a dependency like you would for JavaScript um, where they have NPM. Yeah, definitely. Um, in our case, since we have this, uh, so it again kind of depends on the, the way that you're including them. Um, in the case of like dynamic linking, uh, we'll start there because it's simplest. Uh, the package URLs are dependent on the system package manager. So like if you're um, using Debian uh, and using apt on Debian uh, and we find this inside of your package manager, then we'll just rely on apt's uh, information. So, you know, whatever homepage is given for that is the homepage for that package. Uh, for, um, for vendor source code, uh, essentially, that depends on where we have seen that source code. So uh, at the very, or when I first talked about the VSI process, essentially we um, scan known open source code hosts. So like, for example, GitHub, um, you know, we'll scan GitHub open source repositories, and that way we can match them up with your uh, dependencies later. And we know where we scan this from, and therefore we are able to tell you you know, where that code is, um, or at least where we saw it. So like, uh, depending on, depending on where we got it from, like, you know, GitHub, a specific project on GitHub or, um, other source code hosts, like, uh, for example, we don't support this today, but, um, we're working, we're planning to work on it, but like, for example, uh, SourceForge, um, or other code hosts like that, like we would know that this dependency came from this place and therefore point you there. Um, and then the last one is like static linking, which since it's binary only, um, there's not a great way to tell you where the source code came from. Uh, and, you know, it's a binary, so there is no source code attached and there's, um, you know, it's not in a system package manager usually. So uh, with that one, we kind of rely on the information that is given at the time that the binary is, is linked into FASA. That's great. And I'm purposely speaking slowly now in case anybody has any last final questions they want to toss into the q and I know one's going to come as soon as I start wrapping things up, but um, I'll, I'll do it anyway. Um, thanks again to the Linux Foundation. Thank you, Jess, for sharing um, all of your experience with us. If you have any more questions or you'd like to talk with us more about dependency management, especially with C++, you can reach us at resources at fasa.com. And if you'd like to give FASA a try, you can try us at try.fasa.com.
Um, want to wish everybody a very wonderful holidays. Um, thanks for joining us and thanks again, Jess. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica and Aaron, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.